next week and we can get this started now. So yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me, Aaron, and for, for DBCLS for having me here. So I'll be here for a month. Just a week's gone. So I'm okay okay with the being jet lagged, so I'm fine now. So if I start sleeping, there's something wrong that completely is not jet lagged. So what I'll be what I'll be talking about is large scale text mining for biological data. I will be also talking about some things that my impression was people wanted actually to hear, but I wasn't, I wasn't the right person to do that, so it's about Taverna. So I'll just very briefly mention what Taverna is doing because I'm because Taverna is now being developed at the University of Manchester. So I'll just very briefly talk about Taverna towards the end and also see how text mining can be used as part of the Taverna workbench. So my understanding of what's going on today is actually to look how to make sense of big biological data using parallel and distributed pro pro uh, computing. Because as, as a consequence of large-scale data generation, there is a, uh, and, uh, for high throughput experiments, there is a lot of data sitting around which calls for uh, efforts like this, that we've seen with Biomart, where you need to model, store, and, and, and analyze the data. Also produce a <coughs> metadata, and there is always a problem of missing a lot of metadata that could be used actually for data integration. Literature is one of the secondary data that has been generated by analyzing and interpreting what has gone in real experiments and then trying to comprehend that and put it in, in, a, in a particular context. So what I will be arguing today is actually that what we need is kind of integrated text and uh, data and text analytics where text is actually what other people or you have done in the in, in past, so something that's been consolidated where you have text analytics that actually talks about what is being done at the, at the moment. So trying to put these things together. So as you all probably know, biomedical literature is, is huge, so there is around 19 million references in, in Medline, although only 10 million are actually abstracts that you can process, because the rest are just abstracts in other languages are not available. So it's around 10 million references is what we, are, we can be working on. So every two minutes you have one new publication. There is one million uh, full text articles that are somehow open in open access. Like I, I say somehow because it is one million, but it's not actually you can't text mine one million. You can text mine only uh, 100,000. So the aim of literature mining is to locate and extract relevant biological data. This is, again, if you, if you look at the use cases, this is what biologists really need. They want relevant data. They don't want large-scale processing. It is just large-scale for the sake of being large-scale. So it has to be focused. And the idea is, as I said at the beginning, to integrate this data and cross-link it with other biological data sources. So the idea is, at the end, to get something like this, you have literature, and, but you want to link that to other data, data sources that you have in biology. For that, it is very important to find the identity of concepts, the things that are being talked about in the, in, in the literature, and I'll be talking about that in, the, in, the, in a moment. Because I don't know how many of you are aware of text mining and, 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 and how text mining generally works, I just have just very briefly one slide that says, what is the general tech mining framework? So what you generally do, you have information retrieval stack where you first, from the bunch of documents from the Medline, you're trying to extract or find those that are somehow relevant for your particular topic. Then you do information extraction where you try to extract them concepts that are related to what you want to do. And then you do some data analytics with the results that uh, are produced by information extraction. So, information retrieval works with unstructured data. As a result of information extraction, you generally get some semi-structured form, and then based on that, you make some analysis, build networks, predictions, or whatever. Obviously, if you if you are looking for challenges in distributed in, in the parallel processing, you can immediately see the information retrieval having 10 million documents to process. You need to deal with huge number of documents, and if you try to filter data, you may try to reduce the number of false positives, so documents that you shouldn't be processing really for your specific for your specific focus. Information extraction, on the other hand, is typically much more complex than information retrieval, as we will see 
in the, uh, a bit later because you will need to apply a number of processors, I mean tools that will uh, process the data. So what I will be talking about today is I'll give examples of two particular or two common tasks in text mining, so name entity identification and event abstraction, and then talk about some challenges in large scale processing and time permitting I'll try to talk about how to integrate text mining with other with other data. So typically the two typical tasks that I will cover as I said are named entity identification and information extraction. So for named entity recognition uh, identification the task here is to recognize and link the mentions of particular uh, entities or concepts that are be, appear in biomedical literature, so genes, species, drugs, the, the tissues, and stuff like that. So the idea is to link them uh, unambiguously to biological databases, so that we know that we are talking about a particular, about a particular gene or a particular species. Major issues are here, as I mentioned already, focus. Biologists are typically not really interested in all semantic types that you might want, right? So they're interested in particular type and particular uh, concepts that are related to that one. So how to focus your name identification is a huge problem. Traditional text processing problems are variability of names. So you have a lot of synonyms for the same concept, for the same object. And the other problem, probably more difficult to deal with, is ambiguity of names or polysemy. So all these things, as you can see here, are gene names that appear in literature, including this one, nice hairy, or icon, traffic jam, so this is the name of a, of a, of a gene that appears in, in Medline, or approximated. So how, imagine how many of these you do have in, in literature that you then need to be able to say, okay, this is not really the gene name, this is the name of a particular gene. Or you have species that are called this, or laser, or beta, beta, and so on and so forth. So dealing with this stuff is, is, is really difficult. So I'll give you two examples of named entity identification tools that we've developed in, in our group. So Linnaeus is the first, first one I'll mention. So Linnaeus is the tool for species name identification in text. So the idea is here to recognize the names of species that are more than half a million species around, and to map them to NCBI taxonomy. Okay? The method, and I won't go into all details, uses extensive dictionary with some variation uh, that have been embedded in the dictionary, and then various post-processing and disambiguation techniques. Just to tell you how important it is, between 11 and 14 uh, percent of, ambiguity, of uh, species mentions are ambiguous. Right, where you don't know whether a particular strain is a species or not, or whether it is one or the other other species. I'll give you some examples in a moment. Uh, we've done evaluation on a manually curated corpus for 100 full text articles, and precision and recall are relatively relatively good with the interannotator agreement of almost 90, with a cap of cap of 90 percent almost. Here's the architecture of how Linnaeus does the things. So you have NCBI dictionary, you have some manual edit terms, you generate regular expressions that describe the variability in the domain, you make the DFA automaton, which then you apply on, on your documents, on documents automaton, you get a preliminary task, so candidate species names, which you then try in a number of steps to disambiguate and val validate whether they are or not species names. I won't go into all details of the process to take me the whole slot, I guess. I'll just give you some statistics to get a feel how, how complicated the task might be. So, in our dictionary, there is 670,000 different terms and altogether more than 700 species term combinations because the same, even in the dictionary, the same name is used to, to refer to different species, right? So E. coli, in most cases it is Echerichia coli, coli, or it can be something else. I can't remember now, I think I have it on one of the slides later, right? So even in the dictionary there is ambiguity on the level of 1.066. So one concept, sorry, one term 
refers to 1.066 uh, concept on average. We also added a number of uh, common names that are not part of the dictionary, but people use to refer to species, right? So patient, man, and woman, if you see that, it's probably we are talking about a human. Uh, human species, fruit life, surprisingly, wasn't in NCBI taxonomy. We also work with acronyms because people have a lot of acronyms and abbreviations for species names, as I mentioned already, E. coli is an example. Interestingly, we also expanded the dictionaries with cell lines because cell lines can be proxies to species names. So if you mention a uh, cell line in your paper, the chances are that you're talking about humans, right? Because this is human, human cell line. Right, so, how we do this abbreviation? There are a couple of heuristics that we use. One of them is that if we have a mention of a species name that is ambiguous, then we look elsewhere in the document and see whether there is a mention that can be disambiguated with some confidence. If there is, then we disambiguate all the, all the uh, mentions in that document based on that, on that one word that you can. Disambiguate. It works very well. It even doesn't matter whether the, you have mentioned that's been uh, clear or um, non ambiguous in, at the beginning or after the mention that you have to disambiguate, right? So it doesn't work. It, it doesn't matter, right? Wherever it, wherever it is in the document. We also do acronym prioritization. So if there is an acronym introduced in the document, then okay, yeah, you use that definition of acronym and then. Uh, do the, do the uh, disambiguation. We also do pre-computing of distribution of prob probabilities. So we've done pot processing of Medline on a large scale to see how frequently each of the candidate terms appears non-ambiguously in the literature. And based on that, we have some distribution of probability to say, okay, if this one we can't still disambiguate, then we can, based on the background probabilities from, from, from PubMed, say, well, in 99% of cases, E. coli refers to Echerichia coli, so we're going to disambiguate to do that. And it works relatively good. What we also do is, if we have a term that refers to genera, like Drosophila, in most cases, actually, Drosophila is a synonym for Drosophila melanogaster. So we do this kind of disintegration and linking as well. Right. So, as I said, I'll, I'll just very briefly talk about the, 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 the algorithms behind this. So let's see how it works in, 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 in practice. So creating an automaton from the dictionary of more than a half million terms takes a lot of time. It takes around 30 hours to generate on, 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 a, on a big cluster. An alternative is to take that to a dictionary where you have a dictionary with all variants. So you pre-compute the variants and then have a dictionary of variants and then just do simple string matching. Loading this big dictionary to start the system take, may take up to, to, to a minute. And then when we apply that, the times are not that bad. So we can process the whole 10 million Medline abstracts in five hours time, which is relatively Okay, and 100,000 PMC, so public central full text articles in around four, four hours. Let's look at the, at the scale here, right? So this is 1% of this, okay? And the time is more or less the same, right? So text mining is now moving to processing more and more full text documents, not only abstracts that are in PubMed, but there will be, there will be a huge computational problem here. Right, so 1% takes more or less comparable, comparable time. Just a comment here that the main fun factor that influences actually processing time is not really the species name tagging. It is more XML uh, document parsing because we have documents that are in XML. So taking document parsing, finding where the text is, and all this is actually taking up the time rather than, than really the, the, the species name identification. 
So just very briefly some stats. So when you process 10 million abstracts, 74% of abstracts have species names. There are still 26% of articles that don't mention species name that they discuss at all, right? In most cases, these are probably human. So clinical, clinical papers where it is assumed that people talk about humans. So we discovered 30 million species tags. Uh, 800,000 mentions of cell lines, so cell lines are important proxy, and 57,000 different genes have been mentioned. I mention this number because this number is because this goes now into, into a database where you can do some kind of data analysis, see which genes are being discussed together, which genes relate to this species, and so on and forth, and so on and so forth. 96% of full-text articles have species mentions because sometimes you have a case that species are not mentioned in the abstract but are mentioned in the, in the full-text article, so this number goes up. The number of species and the species mentions, as you can see, are comparable to the, to the science. As I mentioned already, from 11 to 14% of mentions are ambiguous, but using the simple heuristic that I mentioned before, you can actually reduce the, the disambiguation rate down to 1.5%. So only 1.5% of species mentions are at the end left, left disambiguated, uh, sorry, non-disambiguated. So the tool is freely available, so Linux is, is a source approach, so it is, it is available as a, as a standalone, but also there is a web service, so you can get something like so you, you, you can query through, 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 through soul and get uh, get answer. So th this is what I mentioned. So if you have E. coli, it can be it can be E. coli or Entamoeba coli, right? So two different species. There is a web demo as well. So this this the Linux was developed as part of a project with Biomed Central, where the idea was to help publisher identify which species a particular paper uh, talks about in order to improve the pre uh, article preparation process. Okay? So there have been many articles that had some typographic errors even for the things that they talk about. Right? So this is an example for a paper that describes uh, sequencing of genome for this species Arsus hibetanus, hibetanus, right, where they managed to get the name of the species wrong in the paper, right? So it has to be TH, right? So the software could identify this and even in the article preparation stage show it to the, to the users and they can, they, can, they can take it. So this is just a demo that where you can see for a particular document what are the species that are mentioned and which are potentially wrong. So this one has really misspelled, so misspelled species, but if you have ambiguous ones, you, you could also find, say, okay, so you're mentioning E. coli, so what did you mean? Is it Eureka coli or something else? Right, so how is Linux implemented? Well, because we, we wanted Linux to be part of other tools, so what we did, we tried to make software in a client-server uh, version where you can run Linux in, in, in different threads, and then any other tool can then call Linux to, to identify species if needed. To demonstrate that, I'll just briefly mention another tool that has been developed in collaboration with colleagues from a couple of universities, so from University from Budapest and uh, Berlin and Arizona State University. So the system is called GDAT. Stands a thing for gene name annotation tool. So the idea is to identify to do the same thing for genes, right? Undatify gene mentions in, in literature. So it recognizes gene names from entry gene and uniprot, so each mention is linked to one of the, of the databases. It is, however, limited to 25 species. Uh, the main reasons are so there are two main reasons. I'll mention it later. So Around 30 species cover 95% of all mentions, right? So very few mentions are for other species, exotic species. Most of people work on these 25 to 30 species. 
On the other hand, loading all the all the dictionary gene name dictionaries for all half a million species is just prohibitively computationally and memory expensive, right? So the system currently just focuses on the most frequent on the most frequent ones. The architecture is simple in that sense that NUT expects Linnaeus and any other dictionary servers that you might have uh, as so it has them as a services. So services then are called from by NUT and data is then integrated and post processed. Other dictionary services might be so NUT is uh, relying on Go terms to do the identification. So if you have a gene mentioned which is ambiguous and you don't know which gene you are talking about, you can see what is in the context. Are there any Go ontology terms around it? Then go to the database and see which of the Go, which of the candidate gene terms are associated with these Go terms, and that this can help in your disambiguation, right? So this kind of knowledge-based disambiguation, not only what Linnaeus does as statistical base. So here is, right, okay, let me see what is in the context. Are there any Go terms mentioned around it? Then go to the database and see what you can get from there. Anyway, what about GNAT implementation? At the moment, it, it, it is implementing this online service for and identity recognition. It is memory incentive. Intensive, sorry, as I said, and even for 25 most common speeches, in particular in the start time, because you need to read all these dictionaries. We also are thinking at the moment of making it as a kind of mixture of client and server architecture, where you would be able to host your own dictionaries on your uh, on your on your on, 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 on your machine, and then communicate with the servers. This would provide you with the possibility to have specialized focused species and additional genes that you may want to, to identify. So if you have a species that you're interested in, so you're not interested in all 25 species, then you don't need to really run the whole service for 25, 45 species. So what about GNAT in action? So starting all different dictionaries, dictionary services can take up to 10 minutes, right? So that's why it is important to have a service. So service, you can't really do it on, in, in, a, in a pipeline where for every single, for example, document that you need to process to run, you can't run it as a separate, as a separate service, right? Because it will take 10 minutes only to, to load up all the, all the services. Uh, full processing time for full text documents is around or from 1 to 10 seconds, but no, this includes processing of species and both terms, right? So everything together is up to 10 seconds per document, which is a lot, right? When you multiply this with the potential scale, scale of all med lines, so this can end up, pile up to, to a big, to, 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 to uh, a significant amount, significant amount of time. Anyway, just some statistics, so we applied on the call of MedLine, so we have 8.6 million mentions in PubMed Central, so 100,000 articles, we have 1.8 million mentions. So there is a lot of data that you might want to do, use some, some kind of processing. 80,000 different genes were reported. As I said, 95% of gene entries are covered by the 32 dictionaries, by 30 they belong to 32 species. Okay, so 95%. GNAT is also available. It is open source, so you can you can download it and use it. Use it. There is a web service as well, hosted in Manchester, so you can you can use that one as well. And here is the, just an output of, of of the service. Just just to. Make it clear, you will also, you'll, you'll have genes, but you might have a go for that well and species, so it's all integrated, right? So the output of GNAT will tell you, right, this is the species, these are the go, to, go codes, the go terms, and these are the genes in one document. Right, so this was about named entity recognition. Let me briefly talk about event extraction, so extracting and linking things that 
appear in, in, the, in, in the literature. I'll give you an example of a gene expression minor that we developed by linking gene mentions and anatomical locations and trying to make a database that provides you with the information on which particular location, particular gene has been reported to be expressed. Okay, so for species name, sorry, for gene name identification we use MAT, for anatomical name density recognition we built uh, another name density recognizer to do annotation. So, architecture is, of this event extractor, is something like this, right? You have your NAT dictionary, you have your anatomy dictionary, here are the articles, you apply name entity recognition first, once you have all the named, named entities, all the entities that you need somehow to link, then you apply another set of tools that try to do detection of some enumeration and acronyms, but also more importantly trying to link entities that we identified here triggers that tell us that there is a gene expression being reported and for that you need, or we at least use, uh, parsing. Okay, so linguistic parsing when we get, I think I have it on the next screen, when you get representation of a sentence in a, in a, in a form where you can do some kind of reasoning, so this is a linguistic re result of the, the linguistic processing, that tells you, okay, yeah, this particular entity is somehow linked to another one, linguistically. And then from these linguistic links, we are trying to infer uh, biological, biological links. So, for example, for this example here, bracket to alter the expression of CBP in T cells. So, what we are trying to infer here is that the location is going to be T cell, and the expression of CBP is what's been what's been uh, talked about here, right? So the CBP is expressed in T cell. As before, I'm not going to go into all text mining details, just to get an idea what is involved. The problem here is that parsing takes a lot of time, right? So producing the parse tree does take time. This is a bottleneck, okay? Inferring this stuff is also difficult because you might need to consult some, some external resources to see that uh, to, to see to see the links. We have we evaluated the, the GADEM tool on BioNLP shared 2009 data, and here are the the results. So the precision is between 60 and 74 percent recall between 20 and 24 percent. So recall is low. So we are still not able to identify many, many gene expression events, right? Because they are variable, there is a lot of variability how these events are expressed, okay? When we look at the false negatives, so what, what are we missing? Surprisingly, or not, so we are still not able to identify gene names. So gene names are account for 50%, for half of all missing events are because we can't really find the constituents, we can't get the, event, uh, sorry, the genes right in text. Okay? And then you have many other, many other problems here. Okay? So, we have still applied, although precision is reasonable, uh, recall is low. We applied to still get them on the call of Medline and what we got back is 578,000 mentions of gene location pairs, right? So if you, if you multiply this by 5, so because our recall is only 20%, okay, around 20%, times 5, so that the, there is 2.5 million of potentially of gene location uh, expressions in the document. Okay? There are 240,000 different gene location combinations and 60% of them have been mentioned only once. So somebody somewhere did an experiment and they said, okay, this gene has been expressed in this particular tissue, right? Or cell or whatever. Uh, so it takes around 10, 
segments per abstract overall to, to, to run together, uh, including the parsing and everything, everything else. So if you look at the results, I think I've got table here. So interleukin 2 and T cell pair has been the most widely reported exp gene expression in the literature. Right? Okay, so three and a half thousand times. So even precision is around 70%. If you find this thing in three and a half thousand mentions, you can be pretty sure that this is probably really what's what's happening. Okay, so gene uh, GEDEM is also publicly available. There is a service, but there, there is also a web demo, so you can try it here. I think I've got it right. So if you type BRCA1, you, you will be asked which BRCA1 because it is ambiguous. You meant, so you can, let's try this one. So you'll get all the locations where BRCA1 has been reported to be expressed, so you can select one of them, you'll get all the documents, so you'll have a list of documents, whether they are open or not, and you'll have a sentence that tells you where the, where the, where this information came from, so you can read either the sentence or the whole, the whole document. Also, if you want to see what else is represented, uh, expressed in lung, so you can click on lung, and then you'll get all the genes that have been reported to be expressed in lung and continue so playing with all these kind of things. As I said, you can have a service for that as well. Right, so as you see, I, I have slides just in case the service is down. I'll come back to this comment in a moment. So, once you have all these data, sorry, text mining results, what can you do with them? Right? Do you want to, can you put them somehow together? This is what we did in as part of this integrator collaboration with the uh, with, uh, colleagues from, from NEBC. This is a bioinformatics center in, in Oxford for environmental science. And the idea here is to provide ontology-based faceted browsing of multiple integrated data resources. So at the moment there are five databases, they're all genomic databases that have been integrated with Medline Articles. I'll show you in, in a moment. But the idea is that these five, sorry, four databases and Medline are linked using species taxonomy, anatomy ontology, environmental ontology, and gear locations because we, they wanted to know where particular, uh, particular, for example, bacterial uh, infection has been going on. So they needed geo, uh, geographical locations as well. So each database is indexed by all of these ontologies, and then using these ontologies, the data is integrated. So this is how, we, how it looks like. So you have four different uh, faceted uh, browsers here, sorry, not browsers, four facets, where you can select what you want, and the results will be displayed here. And the five resources are available, so one, two, three, four, five, so you can then uh, switch and look how this data has been uh, indexed in each of these databases. The point here is what I want to, to make, the point that I want to make here is that we managed to integrate, so Medline, PubMed, with other databases so that you can have kind of uh, integrated search over structured databases and also unstructured data like Medline. Right. So, let me say a few words about the challenges for large-scale large text processing. So, most of the things that we use are dictionary lookup. It takes time to build DFA and to load it, so this is, this is a problematic. So, these tasks are memory-intensive tasks. This is what is it, 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 a huge problem, because dictionaries are big. The processing time is, okay, I would say, relatively reasonable, right? So, a couple of hours would be okay. If you use multi-thread approach, so if you, for example, if you run Linux on eight threads, we can process Medline in an hour or so, which is reasonable, right? You can get the result of the entire Medline in an hour, which is, which is relatively good enough. Similar thing is for regular 
mentioned regular expression and stuff like that. The problem is, unfortunately, syntactic parsing. So syntactic parsing does take a lot, a long time. So it could be 10 seconds per document, full text document, and this is really just still a lot. The good news is that most of NLP tasks, tasks are pipelines of different things. On one hand, you, ha you, you, you can pile up the time, but on the other hand, because you have a workflow of things, you can distribute these, these tasks in, 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 in different machines. So this somehow does call for potential that you can distribute uh, the task on different machines, right? And then try to integrate the data later. There are very few, at least I'm not aware of many, NLP uh, tasks that are done on cross-sentence or on, uh, at the document level. So most of processing is done on a small chunk of stuff that you can then parallelize, right? And process each sentence, even if you want to do that, on different machines. Okay, there are some tasks where you can't do that, so an after resolution and stuff like that, but still, that most of the tasks can be parallelized at least on a, docu at a, on a document level. And the point that I want to make here is most of NLP tasks should be a one-off effort anyway. Okay? So, if you do, if you have a good named entity recognizer, so you identify species or genes, why would you do it 20,000 times? Why don't you do it once? And why don't we exchange the data? So that there is a huge, I, I, I guess, problem with not exchanging the secondary, secondary or process data that is result of text mining. Everybody is parsing in that line, right? Using the tools that are available, right? So I assume Andrew has been used 20,000 times so far to process the whole of that line, right? With the same thing, the same data, you have the same results and again and again. The problem is, obviously, we can't even exchange primary data easily. So that's the problem with text mining in general, but some, some tools that mentioned this morning, it's a problem in other areas, right? So we don't have... We have two problems. First of all, there is a lot of uh, access rights problems in, in text processing. Only 1% of Medline is really open access, right? Only 1%, right? Everything else is covered by, by access rights, or prohibited right, by access rights. There is a problem with data sharing and exchange standards. There is a lot lack of format, formats that are to be used within the community. There are some initiatives here in my case, but these are mostly focused on exchanging solutions rather than data, right? So you can plug in a particular tool in your framework or in gate framework and it will work, but not really about so, exchanging the results. So, but there's still some initiatives. So Genia format's been reused in many cases. Uh, EXML is used in some projects as, as exchange format and so on and so forth. And finally, significant amount of processing time is lost on conversions. That's why I'm trying to, to make the point of using standard approaches. So converting from one format to another, so doing non-NLP tasks, XML processing, communication with database, input output, it does take, does take time. So, do we need text mining as a service? Okay, should text mining tools be available as service? Okay, well, services do go down, as we are all, we all experience, and typically they are not available for large-scale processing. I'm not aware of anybody who would let you their service to, to, to process the whole net line in, in, a, in, in, a, in a bunch. And uh, so not availability is a problem. So you can't do it. Service, uh, services go down. They go down for large-scale processing or for demos, as, we, as you probably know. And what I'm advocating here is, wouldn't be the more stable solution if you have just the data that's being pre-processed and then you have a retrieval. It is a service again, I know, but at least you don't, the, 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 the response time is going to be shorter, right? So instead of parsing Medline abstracts, why don't you just see somewhere just some return? There are some already 
efforts in that in that in that area. So I, I, I know that the Jewish is already having Virginia, but sorry, Med Medline passed as 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 something to get use. Standalone or local services are always an alternative if you can get the 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 the, the code from from the authors. However, where I see the role of services in text mining, that they're definitely useful for, for developing text mining for developing text mining applications. So in the process where you try to develop something so that you can just just reuse the service that's been run somewhere as for, for developing a prototype. And it's also useful for linking with other bioinformatics tools. Well, that will bring me to, to Taverna. And I know that some people wanted to hear about Taverna, but I can I can skip that because I, I see I, I will all, almost run out of my time. So, do you want me to, to go very briefly? Yeah, okay. You can speak. Are you okay? Anybody fell asleep? Or? Right, so I'll, I'll just really very briefly uh, mention how to, to integrate all these things in, in, a, in, a, in a bioinformatics framework. If you are interested in, in, in this in more detail, there will be somebody from, from Manchester and from the Taverna team next week. So we can organize uh, either a hands-on workshop or presentation or whatever you want. And however deep you may want, want it to, 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 to be. So, Taverna is a workflow management suite where you can define and describe what you really want to do, including which services you would like to, to run. And the service spectrum that you can run is really wide, so you can run really a, a huge number of different types of services. It is freely available, so it, it is open source, you can, you can use it, and what they usually say, it is a framework for the data-driven researcher of the future, right? So if you have a lot of data, then the learner should be able to help you with that. So this is a typical scenario, uh, as you probably have noticed that these are not my slides, so you see that they're all full of images and so on. So, so I'm just trying to interpret what, what are the slides. Right, so you, you have a lot of data, including text mining, so I add that just to make it more relevant. Right, so you have a researcher, you need somehow to integrate these things uh, in, into, in, into one, one framework that you can make sense of. So how can you process all these things systematically. If you have 1,000 genes, or 100 genes from, coming from QTL, and in the next gen sequencing, you give you ten, tens of thousands of genes. So, Taverna is part of uh, many other tools that have been put together. I won't go into details, I just mentioned one of them, where you have my experiment, where you store known workflows that people have used to solve the problems, so you can reuse them. And you have biocatalog, you can, you can find the services that are available. But I'll mention later the live ray and, and how to run Taverna workflows in a, uh, in a, in a, on, a, on, a, on a portal. Taverna has been used in a lot of different areas, including text mining, but this is more as, as, as a core biology, obviously. I'll just give you two examples from, from, from text mining. So this, these are these have been developed by, by Paul Fisher in, in, in Manchester. So where I see that the potential of workflows is that you don't have to really repeat the work ever and ever again. Even a simple thing like, okay, retrieve me all the articles for a given phenotype from, from, uh, from PubMed may take you some time to, to do, right? So here is the phenotype term, I don't know, particular disease. Get me all the terms. As you can see, hmm, this is not completely a one, or it is not a one liner in any programming language, right? So you will need still to write a couple of lines of code. Having that done by somebody else that you can either use as it is, or just take it, change a bit here, and get something else is a useful thing. So this is how to retrieve articles for, for, for phenotype, how to who retrieve articles for pathways, where a similar thing, where instead of getting the information for a particular phenotype term, you get the data from the keg 
pathway the database descriptions, and you actually have the rest exactly the same, right? So this is where the the value of of workloads are. So reusability. The good thing is what Tavera now can offer or will offer is I'll just keep up here that you can now execute all these things on a portal. So in the past you would actually install Taverna on your local system, you will have some of the services running locally or you will use services that are remote, it doesn't matter, if the services are remote you can use them. But now Taverna can offer running the workflow, so you just need to select the workflow from set the workflow and it will be run for you. Right on a, on, a, on, a, on a particular portal, right? So it will be downloaded, stuff will be, will be run there, and you will be uh, notified when the data is is ready for you to collect. So I ran these two, so the phenotype terms, the PubMed, and the pathway descriptions for PubMed. So you would just get something like this, right? So this is text line, just a set of articles that are related to this particular term or a set of articles related to this particular pathways. Okay? So it's even easier right to run it. You don't need to even have Taverna installed. Taverna also, I guess this is probably relevant for, for, for this audience here, Taverna has been run on the cloud as well recently in September 2010 for analyzing next generation sequencing data. Again, I, I so for the first, for the previous couple of slides, I, I, I know what I was talking about. Now I don't really know what I'm talking about. So please, if you have any questions, leave them for the next week. So what they did, they sequenced DNA from three cattle breeds. So these one, two, and three. So there is 33 million SNPs that they wanted to 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 that they've got, and they wanted to compare the new data with the reference genomes that they, that they had. So they did that. As I said, here is the standard workflow that they've used anyway. Right? So this is the workflow that they would use to compare the data in, 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 in the non-cloud environment. So what they did actually for this one is then try to make that uh, run on the cloud, so there was a week-long hackathon organized in Manchester where they did upload all the next generation sequencing data to the cloud, created a new experiment, run it, the workflow from the previous slide on multiple cloud instances, and then collected the results. So it was a week-long hackathon, that, so they started on Monday without anything, and then by Friday they have everything completed and, 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 and finished. And not only that, so the workflow and, and the environment is now available, so that there is uh, there is a portal where you can access Taverna on the cloud. This is still in experimental phase, but I, I, I think this will be available soon, where you just run the experiments on the cloud directly from, from Taverna. Okay, and this is what I got as, as, a, as the result. And this is how they looked like when it finished, so this is Friday evening before going to, to the to the cloud. Right, so what are the new developments in new, new developments in Taverna now? So it should be, so this is at least a promise slide. So a large data processing should be now much, much easier in Taverna. You could pause, resume and cancel workflows that you are running for whatever reason. So parallelization layer is added on top of, of, of the current execution engine, and the server, so the server that executes different uh, uh, workflows, would allow remote workflow execution, so this is what I just showed with live ray, and workflows could be launched on web pages, so you, you would be able actually to look at the my experiment, here is the workflow, you just click on it, and it's, it's been run, and also that it can be run on the, execute, executed on the cloud. Anyway, so that's most of what I wanted to say. I just want to spend one more slide to say, okay, most of the talks here did mention clinical data. I think that there will be a huge opportunity and a lot of challenges in trying to link genomic data to, to clinical 
and healthcare data. So the personalized data from clinical examination, trials, hospital discharge summaries, medical literature as well. But then there will be a lot of problems with the privacy and anonymity and stuff like that. So this is probably something that is a problem for, for future. Right, so to sum up. So large text mining, large scale text mining is reality now and a necessity, right? So mo many people doing biomedical text mining are moving to full text processing. Full text is not still available, but hopefully it will, it will become more and more common. My impression is that most of the tasks can be distributed. So text mining somehow traditionally works in smaller chunks, right? So that there is a separation of separation of, of topics, so it could be distributed and parallelized. And I guess that's uh, an opportunity. I would like to just repeat my, 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 my kind of plea that process or secondary data should be can be and should be exchanged, right? There is a lot of efforts being going around. We need some kind of data standards and uh, I'll be happy to look at what we to discuss with the lens and stuff like that. So can text mining also fit into, in, into that into that uh, into that framework? RDF, I wasn't I didn't talk about RDF, but there are groups I'm aware who look how to represent the results of text mining in the RDF. Right, so that then it goes immediately as part of bioinformatics land, landscape. And that's probably what is the ultimate aim of what text miners want to do. So one aim of text mining is, yeah, okay, here is for you to browse what can be done. But for a large scale bioinformatics, you want to integrate knowledge from text into other bioinformatics and omics, omics frameworks. That's, that's it. So this, this work has been done with a, with a number of people, right? not only from, 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 my, from my team in Manchester, but there are many other people that have been involved in, in, in different aspects of this work, including some, some funding, funding agencies. And before I end up, I'll just take two seconds of your time to promote a new journal of biomedical semantics, it's like advertisement. Uh, so, there is a new journal that was started last year that is uh, focused on biomedical semantics in two aspects. One is how to make the infrastructure where people in bio research can use biomedical semantics to make inferences, predictions and stuff like that. So, one is about the infrastructure that will include the semantic resources that the domain has, the repositories, how the metadata is produced, how it is managed, Biomedical semantic web and so on and so forth. And the other, so this is the infrastructure. The other part is the real inference and mining. I uh, just like to make it uh, to highlight that the journal is also interested in large scale automated analysis of biomedical data. So if you have something that you would like to report on large scale processing, the journal will be happy to hear from you. Okay, thank you.